engagement from the audience via the conversation chat bar only. So thank you and now back to today's session. Next slide, please. So my name is Amanda Willicott. I'm one of the programme managers for the Value and Health team. And in today's session, we'll be taking a look at phase one of the knee arthroplasty dashboard and some of the bespoke knee arthroplasty analysis. Next slide, please. We have heard this week that the value in health approach focuses on meeting the needs, goals and preferences of patients by involving those patients in decision making and then being able to support this decision making with the best evidence we have. And a key element to achieve this vision is to electronically collect patient reported outcome measures PROMS and to do this routinely at pace and scale by embedding the collection of PROMS and the utilisation of PROMS very much as business as usual. There are actually five key stages to the end to end process for PROMS, collecting the data, combining, analysing and presenting the data and then utilising the information. So this session will focus on combining and presenting the data and there are some key standard products that we have been developing to do this. So firstly, in order to support direct care, we have been creating patient level visuals within the electronic patient record. The data visual you see on slide shows the Oxford Knee Prom score trajectory over time, together with some other useful information to support a patient review, whether that be in person or virtually. This will be further developed in time to combine other clinical data. But today we'll be concentrating on the second product, dashboards. The knee arthroplasty dashboard aims to combine aggregated PROMS, case mix and clinical outcome data from around Wales. And this will initially assess variation in good practice. We'll then present some of the bespoke analysis using PROMS that's been carried out within Cardiff and Vale University Health Board. So I will now pass you over to my colleague Keith, who will introduce the knee arthroplasty dashboard. Thanks very much, Amanda, and thanks everyone for joining. As Amanda mentioned, my name is Keith Hawkins, uh, and I'm lead specialist within the value and health analysis team at the NHS Wales Informatics Service. Uh, just to give you a bit of background, NWIS is a national organisation and we're responsible for supporting the health and care technology used throughout Wales. Uh, so we collect data from numerous sources across Welsh healthcare and we maintain a, a range of national databases which covers secondary care, births, deaths, child health and more. The role my team is, used, is to use the uh, data collected nationally to produce reports to support the National Value in Health programme. To date, the national team have created uh, data visualisations to support direct patient care, showing an individual's PROMS trajectory embedded into the patient electronic record and we've produced three outcome data dashboards to support service planning and quality improvement. These products make up the value in health products. The knee arthroplasty dashboard is the third in the series to be released. The first, the lung cancer dashboard, was released in June last year and Dr Gareth Collier, a chest physician at uh, Howells R UHB, delivered a session on Tuesday about how he uses the dashboard in his daily practice. As part of Value in Health Week, we launched the heart failure dashboard in the session earlier this week. If you missed any of the previous sessions, they're all available and will be made uh, available on our website shortly. So the data dashboards aim to triangulate case mix outcome and costings data. The first release of the knee arthroplasty dashboard brings together uh, data from the national databases to show what can be done nationally. Uh, this is an ongoing learning process for us and we're now actively involved with clinicians and expert users to sense check the data coming out and to evolve the dashboards with an agile and iterative approach to development. Further releases will then include additional data, analyses and functionality guided by this expert reference group to produce reliable information that's useful. So I'm now going to talk a little around some of the challenges we faced in trying to bring together this dashboard um, and the activity data from across Wales before we carry out a little demo of the phase one dashboard. Uh, so next slide, please, Tom. Cheers. OK, so in determining what data is required and available, 
to create an outcomes dashboard, we needed to take a step back and examine the complete patient journey. This slide shows a patient's passage through the NHS from an information point of view, thinking in terms of the data sets the patient may interact with along the way. Our intention is to support the improvement of outcomes, and to do this, we need to bring together all available data to provide the whole picture to support the service in identifying variations in care. The digitization of services and joining up of lo local and national systems in recent years has enabled us access to more and more national data sets to provide a more complete picture of the patient's journey and start to make comparisons nationally. Next slide, please, Tom. Thank you. So if we were to look at what data is available nationally and at patient level for linkage, we build up this rather busy picture, which actually provides quite a positive view that we do collect an enormous amount of patient level health data nationally. However, data sets are often set up for specific uses and using these for different purposes can sometimes lead to flawed analysis. We have lots of data, but turning this into real information is the hard bit. And this is the reason why our expert reference groups are key to making these products useful. These patient level data sets can be linked together using the patient's NHS number to bring the patient's journey to life. In addition, there are many summary level data sets which may be important in understanding outcomes highlighted in yellow to the left of the slide. The three blue highlighted areas represent the core data sets typically triangulated to determine value. We've recently acquired some patient level costings data sorry, costings data into the National Data Warehouse. Claire Green from the Finance Delivery Unit held a session using this data around diabetes pathways with Dr. Julia Platt. We've also got some PROMS data, however, collection is patchy nationally and is for certain clinical areas only. Clinical outcome data in the form of history data is not currently collected nationally in, NH in the NHS in Wales. Given that these data sets are so fundamental in supporting a data-driven value-based approach in Wales, we have started on a journey to enable this data to flow nationally to feed the data dashboards, which we'll be describing shortly. Next slide, please, Tom. Okay. Specifically for the knee arthroplasty dashboard, there have been many challenges faced when trying to obtain outcome data. As previously described, national audit and registry data is not currently collected nationally in Wales. It's normally submitted locally directly to national registries. The National Joint Registry, or NJR, collects information on hip, knee, ankle, elbow and shoulder joint replacement surgery and monitors the performance of joint replacement implants. Health boards submit directly to the NJR using a web portal and receive a report back on where they stand nationally typically 12 to 18 months later when the report is published. We want to change this in Wales and collect the data nationally so that health boards can assess their compliance with regards to audit periodically and in addition reduce the enormous burden of information gathering for audit completion by pre-populating fields with nationally held data and submit to audit once for Wales. So for this first phase of the NEED dashboard, we've been able to use five years of historic audit data from 2013-14 to 18-19 obtained directly from one of our Welsh health boards. This will be updated and added to once the data begins to flow. For those of you who may not know, patient reported outcome measures or PROMs are questionnaires that have been designed and tested with patients and clinicians for specific disease or to monitor the effects of procedures such as knee replacements. They look for changes in the patient's health pre and post treatment and over time to understand quality of life. There are nationally agreed validated PROM tools for knees and the Oxford Knee Score is the national PROM for knee replacements. However, there are multiple platforms used locally which have varying degrees of integration with core systems such as PaaS and coupled with a lack of standardization, data flow is an issue with all platforms. Uh, next slide please, Tom. Thank you. So on Wednesday this week, we held a session to provide further insight into the data standards work that we are currently progressing to support data flow and standardised problems across Wales. But in summary, a Welsh Health Circular was issued on the 4th of March this year to Caldicott Guardians in the Welsh Health Boards and Trusts to mandate the data flow of audit and problems data 
to NWIS to feed the value in health products. As this data is not routinely submitted, a set of data standards change notices or DSCNs detailing data submission requirements will go out to the health boards and trusts and impact assessments will be carried out for the new data collections. The Welsh Information Standards Board, uh, WISBI, provide the information standards assurance around the requested new data flows and in June this year they agreed to the outline process. We have proposed a phased approach to the development and impl implementation of the necessary data flows in order to ensure delivery of the priorities set out by the Value in Health programme in accordance with the resources available both locally and nationally. The first phase of work has now started with the development of a standardised process for the central collection of neophyplasty audit and PROMS data and the first meeting of the stakeholder group to review the draft DSCNs is taking place next week. Formalising the knee outcomes data flows will act as a blueprint for other clinical areas and it is anticipated that the request for heart failure data flows uh, and uh, knee data flows will follow. So next slide please Tom. So we will shortly be showing you a demo of phase one of the knee arthroplasty dashboard. We aim to be able to show the value of high quality data for healthcare improvement, but we accept that we're not there yet and we've got a long way to go. However, we are now have the product, the technical ability to link the data nationally and to visualize in a format that's available to all using Power BI through the NHS Wales Microsoft Enterprise Agreement. Next, we need clinical engagement to steer the development, to create meaningful, helpful analysis and to realize the value of putting the right data in at the start. The data sets have been incorporated into the first phase of the dashboard are listed above. We are hoping the dashboard will initially raise lots of questions about the data. We also hope to provide some insights around good practice and variation in care. The dashboard was created using Microsoft Power BI and will be available today at a summary level to all within NHS Wales. The NHS Wales Office 365 Enterprise Agreement means that all NHS Wales users have access to the Power BI app through Office 365. The dashboard will be made available at a more detailed level with additional filters to those with the required level of access to be patient level data and this needs to be obtained through a Caldecott Guardian or Head of Information. Um, so you can contact us please for further details via our website, uh, the link above. So I'm now going to pass you over to my colleague Tom, who's going to take you through today's demo. Thank you very much. Thank you, Keith. Hello, my name is Tom Adams, and I'm going to run through a demonstration of the knee arthroplasty dashboard. As previously explained, this is the first iteration of the dashboard, and we hope to evolve it over time with additional data, analyses, and functionality guided by our expert reference group. I am going to open up the dashboard and demo the first slide to illustrate the interactivity and alternate between slides as the speed of the dashboard will be influenced by the number of people on the call. Please bear with us. First of all, we will look at some activity data. The first slide shows an overview of all knee arthroplasty procedures for the National Secondary Care data set. We are currently looking at the data from the latest complete year 2019 20, but data can be viewed to date if preferred allowing for a time lag in clinical coding. The dashboard focuses at the moment mainly on total knee replacements, as you can see from the bottom left visual on the procedures by type. However, partial revisions and resurfacings are also included. The first view sh shows comparisons by provider over time by type and median length of the stay. The dashboard is completely interactive. For example, you can click on a bar in this graph and it will filter and update all the other visuals. Filters down the left hand side of the page allow the user to explore the data further and splice and dice the data as required. For example, applying the filter to focus on revision procedures.
The dashboard aims to allow exploration of data for the purposes of examining link variation and good practice. Um, I'll click on the focus on the TKRs button. Um, you can examine types of TKR procedures carried out by the health board. Uh, we understand that there is some sometimes debate whether to use cemented or not in joint replacements, and we can highlight this variation in use, especially in one health board. However, there are other valid reasons for variation, and these can be explored within the dashboard by examining the data while supplying the appropriate filters. The visual in the top right shows the number of new procedures over time. Um, this visual can also be toggled to show a health board comparison. Um, this can be useful in monitoring new procedure activity rates and understanding variation between health boards. This slide depicts length of stay for total knee replacement patients. The box and whisker plot is useful in pairing the variation within and between health boards with regards to patients' length of stay. The length of the box represents the middle 50% of data. A narrow box represents greater consistency between the patient length of stay. The longer the box, the more variation. The line across the middle represents the median value for each health board. As you can see, the last health board has a lower median length of stay than the other health boards. Hovering over the box plots provides further information such as number of discharges and the average length of stay, which give, gives an indication of how the data is skewed. The table in the bottom left gives a deeper level of insight as it shows the median length of stay by hospital site. Activity data has been linked to any attendances here to show both readmissions to hospital and any attendances within 30 days of patient being discharged following a knee arthroplasty procedure. Variation can be seen across health boards and interestingly, the health board with low submission rate has the highest A&E attendances rate. In future iterations, once the registry data is flowing, linking to registry data and PROMS will hopefully provide a much fuller picture of readmissions. We can now switch to a patient demographics view of the data to look at activity rates in the population and link patient demographics to the Welsh Index of Multiple Deprivation to examine the role that deprivation has in activity. The map visual shows the health board arthroplasty rates per 100k population and the visual in the bottom right shows the proportion of each health board health board's population that live in differing differing quartiles of deprived areas in Wales. It can be seen that some health boards have a greater proportion of patients from more deprived areas than others, a further factor which may need to be considered when trying to understand activity. These visuals can also be viewed at a unitary authority level and also a primary care cluster level. Uh, we'll now move on to look at patient flows. The slide tries to illustrate patient flows within an organisation. The data shows the proportion of patients treated within a health board who are from, re from the resident population. You can see that there is much variation within the health boards. For example, provider health board one shows that 93% of procedures are for resident patients, whereas 7% are non-resident patients. Table view can also be used to provide further detail. For example, Provider Health Board 1 has a majority of resident patients from their own health board, uh, followed by Health Board 
uh, seven. This slide will explore the current National Arthroplasty Audit data we currently hold. As Keith explained, there are developments in place to obtain a data flow of registry data for all health boards to provide a complete picture for Wales. Developing a regular flow of national audit data will allow us to view more patient-specific information, such as their BMI and reasons for surgery, as shown in these visuals. Finally, we'll look at patient PROMS completion rate at each trigger point. The PROMS collected reflects patients who've had an operation and then have either completed or missed a PROM. For example, the percentage of patients completing a baseline PROM is fairly high at roughly 70%. However, this decreases at six months to only 35%. This can be useful in monitoring PROMS compliance rate, rates and identifying trigger points where compliance is low. The value of this dashboard will be fully realised when we are able to link the patient reported outcome data to existing activity and clinical data. For example, linking PROMs to length of stay, readmission rates, BMI and implant data. I would, like now to, I would now like to pass you over to Phil Thomas, who will demonstrate in more detail how we have started to do this. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Tom. Good afternoon, everybody. I'll uh, just put my camera on just to show you that I am here and I am at work. Um, and I'll just uh, take you through um, why I think um, problems are so important in our clinical practice. So uh, I am an adult um, and paediatric hip surgeon, but I did used to do a lot of knee replacements as well. So I feel qualified to comment on a lot of the input that's been happening with the knee dashboard. Um, I've been a consultant in Carbonville for too long and uh, I did my stint as a clinical director for three years and then started as the PROMS national lead in October 2016. Uh, next slide please Tom. So why did we start to collect PROMS? Well personally I started myself when I um, started a new practice in Cardiff or, or South Wales, which was Keyhole Hip Surgery. And before I could start this, I was put in front of a quality and effectiveness board, which I remember quite well, fairly rigorous board asking me why I should be given resources to start this new practice. And one of the and it becomes very um, clear when you start doing uh, this type of collection with a busy practice how difficult this, this is and I'm sure many clinicians can sympathize with um, how difficult I've, I felt this was. So when the chance came to try and get a more national um, collection of problems going I really jumped at the chance. One of the problems we had in, in Cardiff um, was that we had a massive partial booking um, waiting time for patients so patients didn't particularly have appointments to come back so that was something we had to deal with as well but why do we collect problems generally and the main reason is it's actually very patient centric it gives patients much more information about the procedures it informs them about what the other options are and um, it really enables and empowers the patients to make choices for themselves uh, the other reason was to align with the Get It Right First Time initiative. This was procured by the British Orthopaedic Association several years ago and was led by a clinician called Tim Briggs, who's a knee surgeon who went round England and Wales looking at practice. And he found a huge, rather concerning variation in practice across the country. And you know, there were some centres performing extremely well uh, with cheaper implants and others using much more expensive implants and not doing so well. So this became a, a concern. Now in England, PROMs are mandated for um, most arthroplasty procedures 
and is part of the Payment by Results initiative. So really very important to try and uh, support clinicians to collect their data and to get data across health boards. Next slide, please. So as I originally said, uh, the, the first issue for us was trying to get rid of our partial booking um, backload where you can see there were thousands of patients who were really never going to come back and see a consultant after their initial wound checkup. So we knew that we wouldn't be able to see all these patients. So we started sending them out questionnaires. And essentially the questionnaire was a PROM, so a patient reported outcome measure. So for the hip surgeons, it was the Oxford hip score. And for the knee surgeons, uh, for the knee patients, it was a, an Oxford um, knee score. So we had a pretty good response rate here, you know, 84%. And we found that only about three to 5% of these needed to actually come back. So when you identified a low, lower than expected score, it would send the patient the option to come back and discuss what, what the potential problem might be. Uh, but only a few actually came back. Next slide, please. So PROMS is an integral part of value and health. And this is this week's all been about value and healthcare. And really there's a, a pyramid system of how PROMS can help us. It's from direct care at the bottom to the service level, and then integrating this um, with big data to try and get an idea of what the best practice uh, across the country is. And if there are pockets of excellent practice, trying to look into why uh, these particular health boards may be achieving better results than others. Uh, it's not at all to um, be a big brother on surgeons, and I think most clinicians um, I've got over that particular issue and most of us have to put data into joint registries anyway. So we're used to having our results scrutinized. It's really about trying to identify best practice. Next slide, please. So um, this particular project was done using um, a database called Amplitude. Uh, again, many of the clinicians, particularly orthopedic surgeons, will know this database. It runs many of the national registries anyway, such as the uh, ligament registries and the uh, British spinal registry. So it's part of Bluespear, um, which is another data collection software that's used in many hospitals. And we looked at uh, essentially uh, knee replacements that have been done uh, over the last few years. And you can see that when we essentially took out those that didn't have uh, pre and post op scores, we were down to about 1,200 patients, 1,200 knee replacements. And so it's a sizable number. And if you look at the demographics, then uh, you can see the average age. Um, some of you may or may not be surprised at uh, the fact that we have 49% of patients who are in the obese or very obese category. I would hope that if that data was repeated now, that that would be a lot less. Certainly the, the very obese where BMI is over 40, certainly our own health board, we wouldn't recommend those patients have surgery without engaging in a weight loss program first, because we know this particular problem is linked with a much higher infection rate. You can see that the majority were uh, cemented knee replacements, I would be expected with a small number of uncemented knee replacements a reasonable number of half knee replacements or unicondylars. And so the demographics were fairly similar to, I think, in most health boards. Next slide, please. So the first thing that we can see uh, on the uh, graph on the top right there is that knee replacement is a successful procedure. We know this to be true, but the same is true of hip replacement surgery. So this is just really um, confirming what we know in that patients start off generally with a fairly low Oxford score, which means they're in significant pain with limitation of function, and they improve significantly at a time point, which is usually 12 uh, to 24 months afterwards. But if you drill down into the data of the Oxford um, knee score, you'll see that not every um, function or ability is improved by knee replacement surgery. So again, this is something that we can really help patients to decide whether this is for them. For example, pain, as you can see um, on the bottom right graph there, is generally well improved after surgery. 
kneeling, however, uh, is not improved. So this isn't a procedure you might suggest to someone who does a lot of kneeling for a living, such as a plumber or a roofer. So information that patients really need before making decisions as to whether to go ahead with this type of procedure. But generally, a good, good improvement in the vast number of the domains of the Oxford knee score. Next slide, please. So age groups, um, I think a lot of people who do knee replacement surgery will tell you that if patients have a knee replacement at a young age, i.e. under 60, 65, then the results and their uh, outcome is probably not as good as if they have it as an older patient with less demand on the joint itself. And this again is proven by the, uh, by the PROM scores. So if you're in a younger group, you tend not to have quite as much uh, gain as you do in the older group. So patients have to really work out whether this is for them, particularly if they have arthritis at a young age, or perhaps whether other more conservative methods of treatment, such as physiotherapy, pain relieving procedures might be better for them until they get to a certain age. BMI is an interesting one. So I've already said that uh, almost 50% of these patients were either obese or very obese. Um, interestingly, even very obese patients do have a gain from um, this particular project in terms of their scores. But of course, these scores are only at 12 months and the, the sort of, uh, longer scores we've got are probably around about three or four years. So it's far too early to see whether there'd be any loosening of the implant due to the increased weight to the patients. So remember that these are relatively short term um, measures of improvement, but certainly they do improve, but they probably don't get to the level uh, or, the, or the score of the uh, normal weight patients. Next slide, please. Now, uh, we looked at individual surgeons. They're obviously anonymized, um, but uh, I think we were pleased to see that there was no significant variation in the improvement um, depending on which surgeon did the operation. So all did a good volume of operations, which again is a contentious thing uh, amongst our societies and that we're told that you should be doing at least a certain number of operations if you're going to get the best outcomes. Um, but you can see here there was no significant variation between the surgeons performing knee replacements in terms of gain on the Oxford knee score. Next slide, please. So we then looked at the different femoral um, components that were used uh, as part of knee replacement surgery in our health board. And um, quite a few different knees being used, as you can see which uh, I think some of the procurement um, uh, people listening might might think is uh, a bit of an issue in terms of getting best deals for the health boards, et cetera. But, uh, you know, some surgeons like to use particular implants and others like to use different ones. What we did find was that um, in one particular brand, uh, the PROM score was certainly much lower than we would have expected. Next slide, please. So um, we've got a couple of different graphs here. We've got the uh, a funnel plot on the right, which um, those of us who enter data into the national joint registries will be very familiar with. So you can see that the majority of um, knee replacement brands were in the um, safe zone, but you can see that uh, uh, number four here was a, very much an outlier. And when we looked into why that was, this was a particular knee replacement that has an exinium coating to it, uh, which is therefore far more expensive and used for patients who have a uh, query metal hypersensitivity and by definition, younger patients. So perhaps what we're seeing here is not, not that there's something wrong with the implant, but the fact that it's being used in young patients who we know don't have as much gain as older patients. So we've um, identified uh, which surgeons use this and fed this back to them and they're drilling down into the data to see actually whether they might just be just as well using a standard knee replacement for these patients rather than these more expensive exinium knees. So there is a real cost saving that could come out of this exercise. Next slide, please. 
The other thing that's talked a lot about in the literature is picking a sweet spot for when best to do a knee replacement in patients depending on their Oxford knee score. And this is fairly much common sense, but if you start with a much higher score, as you see on the top line on the right, then your gain is going to be very little. Whereas if you're much further down, your gain, i.e. the steepness of the curve, is going to be better. So really, although we can't um, confirm from this data where exactly the best Oxford score is to treat patients, it's common sense that if a patient is scoring above a certain level, it's really not advisable to offer them a knee replacement because they would be very disappointed with the amount of gain they get. Next slide, please. So in summary, this is just one piece of work that we've done um, that I think shows the power of what PROMS can do. Uh, there's a huge amount of data available, and if we can really collate this as is happening with the knee dashboard, then this is very powerful for patients and for clinicians. So I'd really like to congratulate the IT team at NWIS. We've put a lot of effort into putting this dashboard together, and I think um, and I hope that we will have a similar one for hips, for spines and for all other areas of the body uh, before too long. I think we can really use this to benchmark across the health boards and actually have something that's very valuable. And I'm sure something that um, our neighbours in England across the border will soon want to copy. So thank you very much for listening. And if anyone has any questions, then please use the conversation bar on the side. Thanks very much. Thank you, Phil. And um, it is time for some questions now. We've had some questions um, uh, posed prior to and, and during um, this presentation. So, Phil, if I can just stay with you for the moment, because we did have a question asked around um, when we're trying to um, collect PROMs for remote monitoring. And, and unfortunately, um, this person has been um, unable to do that and they've been unsuccessful within their health board. So what advice would you give to anybody trying to, to do this? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, unfortunately, PROMs collection needs resource. And um, as much as you can think, um, that using electronic platforms is going to be the key. You definitely need some people on the ground to to help this process. So uh, in Cardiff, we had two individuals who were charged with chasing up uh, patient scores. And, and I think that's probably why we had a, a good compliance rate. If you look across England, their compliance rate is uh, around about 70 percent. And if you're much below that, I don't think you're really getting the full picture. So um, what we did initially was was paper based for our virtual reviews. So literally it was all paper based and it was sent out uh, to the patients and they returned them by post. And um, even with the amplitude system, uh, the response rate is only about 40 percent. So you need to have um, people chasing these things up. And what I'd like to see in the future is maybe a kiosk in the outpatients where a patient, if they haven't done their scores, can quickly go and do them. Um, you know, and we don't really, we, we, we make it fairly clear that um, this is very much part of patient engagement. And if patients aren't prepared to do their scores, then, you know, that doesn't look, look good on them. Does that okay. answer your question? Yeah, thank you, Phil. Um, we've had some more questions. I'm just going through them at the moment. Um, So Keith, there's been a question with regards to the forthcoming national data resource. And does this make mm -hmm. life easier in terms of data flows and linkage for the dashboard? Uh, yeah, to be honest, I think it's going to be an absolute game changer for the dashboards and uh, our work going forward. So I've worked in the NHS a long time now um, and we've always been quite guilty uh, of working in silos. Um, even within our own organisation in NWIS, we've had lots of different data sets. Um, so admitted patient care data, emergency department data, outpatients data, for instance, but we've never really been very good at, at linking them up together. Um, so we've ended up with quite a lot of data, but not very much information really. So I think the, uh, this, the introduction of the NDR is going to be absolutely key in breaking that down um, and enabling us to really sort of implement a data-driven system 
in Wales um, to be able to link as well activity data with PROMS data to hopefully really sort of you know, improve patient outcomes. So yeah, I think it's going to be absolutely key. OK, thanks, Keith. And, and if I just stay with you for a moment, because there's also been a question then with regards to, um, I think in relation when you mentioned access to um, uh, the uh, dashboard around a usage uh, statistics collected so you can see how many users are accessing the dashboards what pages are more popular maybe what yeah. we need to think about yeah absolutely so yeah, that is one of the uh, the features of power bi so it automatically collects uh, usage statistics so you can see the people who are logging on or the number of people who are logging on and who are using it and and what sort of analysis is the most popular so yeah that will be uh, something we'll definitely be using to, to guide future development as well OK, and I know there was a question on one of the other um, dashboard um, presentations around um, why Power BI, was there particular reasons to this? OK, um, did, go on. so yeah, sorry. So um, I mean, sort of alluded to in my little overview, the, uh, the project started sort of over a year ago now, and initially we had some contractors from um, PwC uh, come in and part of their remit was to to find out the best um, publishing tool we could use for this so Power BI was the one they they chose um, and as it is part of the Microsoft Enterprise Agreement it means that we can use it across the whole of Wales and and implement a sort of once for Wales approach using that so yeah that's the, the main main reason I think so the availability um, to all health boards for Power BI OK, thanks, Keith. Um, Phil, there's, there's been a question around, um, well, I'll read it out, actually. Um, this is excellent. Has the work picked up any patterns in PROM scores identifying variance between pe patella resurfacing versus not at the time of the primary operation? Um, link to that, are you collecting secondary patella resurfacing rates to feed cost and value calculations? Now, there was a piece of work on patella resurfacing or not. Yeah, there was. Um, I saw that uh, question from Andy. Thanks for that. Um, so when we looked at two groups, which um, we did via the CEDA uh, group, we looked at those that had patella resurfacing at the time of surgery and those that didn't. We found no significant difference between their proms. Now, I don't think you can say that that definitely means you shouldn't replace the patella because it's slightly more expensive to do so because a lot of surgeons do it routinely um, because of the fact that if you have to go back and replace the patella later on then that's classed as a revision and the more revisions you have the closer you get to being an outlier on that funnel plot so there's no doubt that some of these things influence what people do and it's very difficult to drill down into the different groups to see whether you know there's a major difference in these outcomes but from the basic work that we did there was no real improvement in proms for those that had their patella resurfaced okay thank you and if i just stay with you a moment phil so there's been a question there with regards to um uh, is the data collection across um uh, private sectors um, uh, as well. So what do you think about, you know, collecting this PROMS data obviously across the private and um, NHS sector? Uh, so I think a lot of individual clinicians collect data privately as well. I certainly collect my data through an amplitude database for hip arthroscopy work. Um, and some insurers insist that you do that because if you don't, they won't recognise you as a specialist in that procedure. Um, but it, there's no there's no compulsory um, status to do that. It's really up to the individual consultant. I know that Nuffield do carry out their own proms, so they do send patients questionnaires um, with uh, an Oxford hip and an Oxford knee score at six months. But not all um, of the hospitals do. But I think they should is the answer. OK, thank you. And um, uh, Keith and Tom, I, I think this one is for you. So um, are there any plans to integrate further data, sort of pre-op procedures, follow up outpatient data, length of time for referral to treatment so that a comparison is across the full pathway as, po as, as possible? 
Um, yeah, so I guess this goes back to the NDR question and uh, how key that'll be. So absolutely. So uh, and we hold uh, data on outpatients um, appointments, for example, referral to treatment data already. So um, we're able to link back to the national data sets we hold to pull out any additional information that uh, we'll need to sort of uh, develop these dashboards. Uh, and that's where the clinical reference groups will, will come in, I guess, um, and telling us uh, what we we need to be pulling out and what uh, will be useful to include in them. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, in, in conjunction with the clinical reference groups, we'll certainly be looking to incorporate the further data that we, we hold. OK, thanks, Keith. And um, and if just if I stay with you then, so we have had queries around um, with the dashboard around the issue of interpretation and okay. distinguishing between common cause and special cause variation. So what would you say to that? OK, yeah, so as I, as I mentioned in my preamble bit, um, so we've basically got two versions of the, the dashboard, one at um, a more high level, so um, without sort of the ability to to compare providers and sites. So hopefully that sort of mitigates any uh, issues with, with people misinterpreting um, reasons for variation, for example. Uh, and then the, the more detailed version where um, there's the, the facility to be able to, to compare providers, for example, to identify variation will be available to the people who uh, um, hopefully are you know, more sort of uh, uh, aware of the data and work with the data so they'll be aware of these issues um so hopefully they'll be um uh, you know that will sort of mitigate as i say the uh, uh risk of uh, misinterpreting the data okay thank, okay thanks keith um phil um mentioned that um you know, hopefully we'll be able to look at analysis and the dashboard across uh, further specialties, so knees um, and maybe spines. Um, so what do you think about scalability of, of, of the dashboard and, um, you know, so the look or feel of them in the future? Yeah, so absolutely. So um, I guess, the, you know, the release of the, the first or subsequent after the lung cancer dashboard, the release of the heart failure and new ones took a little while, but we really wanted to get sort of proper templates in place, uh, which we feel we've done now. Uh, and we feel um, sort of going forward now that uh, future releases for different clinical areas can be a lot quicker because we have all the, uh, the templates and uh, the methods in place to be able to, to produce these. So yeah, so absolutely it's, it's something we, um, we think that uh, we'll be able to scale up and be able to use to, as I say, uh, release these dashboards hopefully quicker in the in the future and be able to use the templates that we've, we've produced. It, it's quite key that for us anyway, that they all have the same sort of look and feel. It's, it's important to, to have that um, branding, I guess, out there. So, um, so yes, it's certainly something that we're very, very aware of, I think. OK, thank you. I think that is probably about the end of our questions at the moment. I can see some comments there um, around um, the need for clinicians and admins analy analysis to work together. Um, and our successes and failures are definitely borne out um, in this in this programme. Um, I suppose just to come back to that slightly, I, I think in Cardiff, um, I suppose we 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 were one of the um, first health boards in in the local area to try and um, standardise PROMS collection across the department, um, and in doing that, does bring um, some challenges. But um, I think the focus was always on um, that we thought big. You know, we started very small, as um, Phil mentioned, um, with a paper collection, which then changed to um, electronic collection. Um, and all the challenges that electronic collection does bring, but it was definitely the thought that we you know we started small in small sectors, but the thought was always big about getting that big data analysis um, and how to change patient care through remote monitoring and be able to provide more flexible ways of, of doing that. So I can't see any more questions at the moment. So um, thank you for everybody for joining the session and we will uh, finish a few minutes early. So thank you. And um, we do have one more session um, uh, coming up this afternoon, which will be uh, the last session um, at 2.30, where you'll be able to find out a little bit more about the team. So please join us there. Thank you.